Again, a warm welcome to everybody today. I pray that the Lord will bless you as you share with us. Um, I can't see everybody that's here other than those who've mentioned um, that they're here via the chat. And I see Velma's also joined us now. Lovely to have you here, Velma. Um, we really just want to pray that the Lord will bless you today. In just a moment, I'm going to sing this song. And then straight after that, I'm going to um, play a video of, of some ministry that, that was recorded for this session. Um, Des Rothman has shared that. And, uh, and then we will um, we'll hear from God's word through that. And then at the end of that, I'll just take over and close out the session. But thank you for being with us today. And um, I pray that you will just, just stay with us through. God has got something for each one of us today. And I know that he will speak to you if you open your heart to him. Um, so let me sing this song and, uh, and, then, and then we can hear from God's word. It's what happens when you get old strings, they start sounding a bit wonky. Heaven knows I've made mistakes Heaven knows I've lost my way before In this broken world Tempted by the ways of darkness There's no fear in my heart anymore This I know for sure there's a sure and never-ending hope within me now How can I repay this love I found Because of Him My life is new again Because of Him This joy will never end Because of Him Oh, I will never be the same Heaven knows my name because of Him People barely recognize me When they look into my eyes They see Jesus in me Though they may not understand it Why I've placed my life within His hands Now that I believe There's a sure and never-ending song within me now How can I repay this love I found Because of Him again because of him this joy will never end because of him oh i will never be the same heaven knows my name because of him my life is new again because of him this joy will never end because of Him Oh, I will never be the same Heaven knows my name Because of Him I can finally see That I am finally free Because of Him you over then to to days for that ministry and I pray that you will be blessed by that today hello everybody I'm going to share with you from the Word of God but just before I start today 
Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you that it is in Jesus' name that we can communicate. And Lord, I just want to pray that as I share these things that are upon my heart, that you folk out there that will be hearing it in one way or the other, at some time or the other, that there might be a blessing for them. Thank you, dear Lord, that you know the hearts of men and women, wherever they are, at whatever time, you're able to communicate truth to them. Bless us now, we pray. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this entire world has been changed, probably forever. So this is probably the end of life as we actually know it. It is as though the clock of life has stopped ticking. And in fact, the hands have actually moved toward midnight. The statistics that we are reading are very frightening. And every nation on the face of the earth is affected by this unknown and unseen enemy. What if this is the end of the world, you may ask? What's happened to our global village? We obey these rules, don't we? It is, after all, the law, even when it's inconvenient and unpleasant for us to do that. So, and even though it has abruptly, may I say, terminated our lifestyle, challenged our attitudes and our plans, Perhaps you're saying to yourself, you know, I don't really understand myself. For I really want to do what is right. But I don't seem to do it. Instead, I'm, I'm doing what I hate. Uh, but if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, then this shows that I'm actually agreeing that the law is good. Good for me. Let me put it in a different way. From Romans chapter 7, verse 15 to 16 the King James Version of the Bible. For that which I do, I allow not. For that which I would, that I do not. But that which I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not consent unto the law, that it is good. Mm. What an interesting way in which we find it actually in the Bible. It goes on to say, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That was the cry of uh, Paul, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he concludes by saying, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're going to talk about the Lord Jesus today. And um, I'm going to illustrate something to you just to start off with. I'm going to show you something relating to this piece of wood that I have here. Okay, so just keep tuned in, and we'll talk about it in a moment. The title of my message is The Iniquity of Us All. This is the sin, the shame, the guilt, and the penalty which is deserving of all humanity, and was laid upon a single man. Single out a man, upon which the sin, the shame, and the guilt and the penalty deserving of every single mortal being upon the face of the earth. Who could take that punishment? Who could bear the weight of that sin? You know, in Psalm 109 verse 25, it says, I became also a reproach unto them. When they looked upon me, they shaked their heads. These were the Roman soldiers at the foot of the cross of the Lord Jesus, having crucified him. Something that they, they did over and over again. But this man was different. And as they looked upon him, they shake their heads. Do you shake your head at the things of God? Isaiah 53 verse 6 of the Bible graphically describes that. All we like sheep, we've gone astray, my friend. Every one of us, we've just turned to his own way. That's what sheep do. They go astray, they, they, they become lost, um, and they are exposed to predators out there. It's very apt, aptly, it's a very aptly description that the Lord uses to describe the likes of you and I. And then the Bible goes on to say, And the Lord, that's the Lord God, hath laid on him, this man, the man Christ Jesus, the iniquity of us all. That is something very, very special. 
Let's get back to that virus. You know, the virus has changed everything. Things are not the same. Uh, the, the, the Christian principle of, of a changed lifestyle occurs in our lives the moment we receive the Lord Jesus Christ into our lives. So talk about everything being changed. When you become a Christian believer, things do change. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's almost as though we, with this uh, coronavirus, uh, have uh, been slotted into uh, this, this change of status quo, this change uh, like a paradigm shift. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. That's what happens actually spiritually when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that this world is very dark and since time immemorial, uh, there has been a lockdown with God. Many have just withdrawn into their shells and shut God out of their lives. And he's been knocking. He wants to come in. Like Revelation 3.20 says, with regard to the churches in Asia, uh, Behold, I stand at the door, knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. That's what it says. And that's from the Bible. To many, the Bible is a forbidden book. Touch not, handle not. Uh, you put your your trust in a mask to keep your distance. And uh, yet, we, one finds that uh, that's not what you're doing with God. Philippians chapter 2 says, uh, with regard to the Christian believer, in verse 15 it says, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. That is what the Christian is to be in this world in which we're living. Locked down or no lockdown. Uh, but where are the Christians? They should be harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. That's what Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15 describes humanity as. A crooked and a perverse nation. And then it says, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And that's what the Christian should be doing. Shining. Shining. Making a difference in a very dark world. Um, making a difference in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation. Righteousness needs to prevail. It's righteousness that exalts a nation. And without righteousness in this country, we've had it, my friend. Because God is holy, is just, and is righteous. So what we do as believers, Christian believers, we hold forth the word of life. That's what we proclaim. That's what we preach. We are careful not to preach ourselves, as may be the case in, in some instances. But we preach Christ and ourselves, your servants, and it is for Jesus' sake. This is a scripture which Christians often quote, and I suppose these days even those who are not Christians quote it. It's from 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14 where it says, If my people, which are called by my name, they shall, if they shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Um, it's an Old Testament reference to God speaking to his own people, my people, referring to the children of Israel. But of course, those who are called by his name would now also be the Christians of our time. Uh, but there's a need to humble themselves to pray, to seek the face of God, but to turn from their wicked ways. Then God says he will hear. But you know, often this is quoted out of, out of context because you actually need to the, read the preceding verses. And if you read verse 12, it says that the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and he said unto him, I've heard thy prayer and I've chosen this place to myself uh, for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, if I command the locust to, to devour the land, or if I send the pestilence among the people, hear that, then if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. We need to humble ourselves, my friend. Call upon the name of the Lord and actually ask for mercy. It's in the Bible where they describe as the Song of Moses. You may not be familiar with the Bible, but just listen, listen to me, listen through, that I make, make some points here. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 30. Moses uh, had upon his heart what God had put there 
uh, to speak to the ears of all the congregation of Israel, it says there in verse 30, and Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel. And there's a sense in which, as I share these thoughts that I have upon my heart, um, that I'm speaking into your ears. Um, I, I want to speak into the ears of all those that would listen, all those out there. The congregation of the world, for that matter, needs to hear the words of this song uh, until they are ended, said Moses. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 1, there is a, a wonderful description by Moses of the things of God. And it says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. It's like an appeal um, that as he would speak, the words of his mouth would be heard. And it says there in verse 2, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the shower upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe your greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, and right is he. Wonderful, precious words from the Bible. It doesn't stop there, uh, because Moses then goes on, and of course he's speaking to the children of Israel, but how relevant are these thoughts now, not to the world in which we are living. It says there in verse 5, it says, They have corrupted themselves. This spot is not the spot of his children, God's children. They are a perverse and a crooked generation. Interesting. Again, reference made to a perverse and crooked generation. In the Old Testament, mind you, and it speaks about the people of God having corrupted themselves because the spot that is upon there is not God's spot. It's not the spot of his children. There's something else there. There's a blemish there that is from somewhere else described as a perverse and crooked generation. Very much like this stick that I'm demonstrating with now. It's crooked. There's a crooked and perverse generation in which we are living right now. Verse 6 says, uh, Do ye thus requite the Lord? O foolish people and unwise, is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Those words speak of uh, what God has done, not only for the children of Israel, um, but God's people. Especially if you're a believer, you need to hear these things, my friend. Um, and he says, uh, you're a foolish people. You're unwise. Now, I'm not saying that you're foolish and unwise, but God's word is saying that. Is he not thy father that hath brought thee? And we need to appreciate um, God having possessed the children of Israel. And likewise, those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ have now become the possession of God. Uh, he is our Father. Uh, he has bought us with the price that is not measured in silver nor in gold, but in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, and He's also made us and He's established us in Himself in a wonderful and in a secure and in a foundational way. And really, uh, it's a reminder to the children of Israel. They've become forgetful, they've become unthankful uh, concerning what uh, God has actually done for them. There are four thoughts that rise out of uh, what I've just shared with you from that reading. They've corrupted themselves, they are spotted, uh, they are perverse, and they are crooked. Four things. One thing leads to the next, and we could easily talk about that, but you could see as you go through those thoughts how that they do lead one to the other and they end up in this corruption which is spoken of. You know that um, we can so easily become proudly arrogant toward the things of God and actually that is to God himself. But God is not mocked. You will reap what you sow, whether to the flesh or to the spirit, because if you sow to the flesh you will of the flesh reap corruption. And if you sow to the spirit you will of the spirit reap life everlasting. That's what the word of God speaks about. And it also describes God as a consuming fire. Second Corinthians chapter 5 um, has this to say in verse 10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. 
Okay, that's speaking about judgment. And perhaps we are at the eve of judgment right now. Who knows? Verse 11 says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And that's what we're doing here today, my friend. We understand that God is a consuming fire. We understand that God needs to be revered. We understand that God needs to uh, be uh, appreciated. Um, and uh, we need to submit ourselves to the laws of God. Because knowing the terror of the Lord, we've just got to persuade men. Friend, we are persuading you today, if you're listening. You may say, well, there's, you know, you're really exaggerating now. Uh, because anyway, if there is a God, uh, he loves anybody and everybody. And by the way, what you've just spoken about was meant for Israel a long, long time ago. Well, my friend, if you feel like that, that that is the case, just don't forget, we are living in a strange lockdown moment right now. Something's come upon the face of this world that cannot be explained. It's inexplicable uh, and it's dangerous. It's life-threatening. Uh, it has brought you and I to our knees, my friend. It's changed everything that you do and I do. Uh, so let's bring this thing a little bit closer to home. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 in the Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous times are here. There is no doubt about it. What are the perilous times that are spoken about in the Bible? Are there catastrophes? Uh, are there avalanches? Are there tsunamis? Are there volcanoes? Are there floods? Are there fires? We are seeing all of that right now. But now we're suddenly seeing something that is so different. Because yeah, we, we don't see the enemy. People are dying. And we have this coronavirus that's shutting us in. It's shutting others out. Um, and yeah, we are having to discipline our lives, obey the law, and, and find ourselves um, in, in a, a cocoon of arrangements that we just don't like. Well, perilous times, if you read carefully there in Timothy, in verse 2, it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves, and that refers to pride. Selfish pride, may I say. Uh, when you love yourself, uh, you, you, you think only of yourself. And People are very, very selfish these days. And then secondly, in verse 4, it says, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Now, um, apart from the pride that I've referred to, we love our pleasure. We love our sports. We love the outdoors. Uh, we, we, we love it. We, we, we'd love to spend our time there. But you don't have time for God. You're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, there's no more pleasure, friend. And pleasure speaks of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And if uh, you have in you the love of the world and the love of the Father, that's Father God, it's not in you. And we've got to make some adjustments in our lives, be sure. Verse 5 says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And we can be so religious, you know, in our behavior. We could have standards, we can have norms, and, you know, we may not steal, uh, you know, we may not swear. Uh, and uh, everything about our lifestyle uh, would seem to be some kind of religious arrangement. In fact, we might even have religion. Uh, yes, we might be performing and participating in some kind of religious activity. And you could be pretty proud of that because lovers of your own self. And so you can say, well, I'm very religious, you know. Um, but as long as I have my pleasure, that goes with it. That's why we are careful that what we are actually presenting from beyond these pulpits is not entertainment. We don't want to appeal uh, to your pride. We don't want to appeal to your, uh, your lust for pleasure. We don't want to appeal to your form of godliness, which is religion. We want to appeal actually to your heart, my friend. Verse 7 of that chapter says, These are ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so we are actually very, very clever people. We are so clever that we've actually worked God out of our thinking, out of the equation. Uh, because the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But also we, we would find that there is this rise of evolution. Uh, the Bible cannot come into our schools, but everything, all the other rubbish can come into our schools. Um, and then we are so clever that we, we are actually going in, into outer space. And, and we, we, we're coming back and we're saying, you know, there's no God out there. <laughs> oh dear, you just have no idea. Well, 
let's get back to the heart. It is actually a heart matter that we are dealing with at the end of the day. I started off by referring to how we would submit ourselves to the laws of man. Um, it's a decision of the heart that you make. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we are actually in control of ourselves. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 7 says that that which is crooked cannot be made straight. And I used a stick to illustrate something that is crooked. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. And we are crooked in a perverse generation. And Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament says that which is crooked cannot be made straight. That is sad news. Well, I can tell you something that uh, your selfishness will never straighten you. Um, your, your pleasure that you indulge in will never straighten you. In actual fact, your religion will never straighten you either. Can you see that this is a crooked? You would ask me, well, Des, how do you know it's crooked? I mean, hello. You can see that it's crooked. And you can actually see when people are crooked. It's a crooked uh, and a perverse generation. When you listen to the language and you, you, you see the corruption uh, and you, you, you are able to pick up the attitudes of people uh, today, you just know there's a crookedness in the world out there. And I'm not being critical. I'm actually wanting to preach what God's word is talking about. And it's talking about those that are crooked and perverse. And the crooked simply cannot be made straight using the mechanisms that I've already mentioned. How do I know that the stick is crooked? It's quite easy to show to you that it's crooked because if I do that, then you will quickly see that there's a straight stick. That stick that is, that is straight will show that the other stick is very, very crooked. Can you see that? It's an easy way of determining that there's a crooked stick here. Where do you fit in, by the way? Are you with the straight stick or are you with the crooked one? Let's go on. Because if you try to change your life or you seek your answers in religion, it's never going to work. It's like trying to bend this crooked stick straight. And that's what religion can do for you. You, you. you try and bend it and then, oops, it's broken. That's what religion can do. There's nothing that you can do to straighten the crookedness in your life. It's like pulling yourself up by your own bootlaces, you know that saying? There's only one who could ever represent a straight stick. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ who lived a perfect life. A life that glorified his Father on this earth. A body thou hast prepared me. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Father, I've glorified thee on the earth. Humanity, especially the Jews, they broke the straight stick. The only perfect man. And they, they took him and they broke him like that. And they nailed him to a cruel Roman gibbet. That was an expression of the love of God, which it commends toward humanity, humanity, as sinners, perverse, crooked. Christ dying for us, allowing his human body to be marred and broken more than any man. The cross. That's why we preach the cross. We preach Christ and Him crucified. To many it might be foolishness, but to us who believe, it is the power of God unto salvation. The Lord Jesus died for the human race. John the Baptist came on the scene in the New Testament scriptures, and we read about this in various Gospels. And in uh, Luke chapter 3, for example, verse 3 onwards, it speaks about the arrival of um, of the one that came uh, out of the desert place. The word of God had come to him and it was the voice of one crying in the wilderness and his cry was, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. It's almost like now we would be saying that to you. Uh, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. 
Verse 5 says, Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked shall be made straight. The rough place uh, way shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. God has a great salvation to offer the likes of you and I. Isaiah 53 verse 6 puts it like this. All we, my friend, like sheep, we've gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We're still doing that, by the way. And the Lord hath laid on him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. That's the theme of my subject. Well, that's the theme of my teaching today, or my preaching. The iniquity of us all. This perverse and crooked nation, generation, all of humanity, placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Just as you cannot straighten a crooked stick, and just like you cannot straight, straighten the crooked soul, religion tries to do that, but you'll only just break your soul and your body, like that stick that I just broke. But Christ had to be broken for our iniquities. Our iniquities are laid upon him, uh, like that straight stick is broken and provides a cross. Uh, I don't know if you have a tattoo. There is a proliferation of tattooed people in, in the world today, including women, by the way. And apparently it is said that idolaters used to paint symbols on their face and their arms to identify them with their favorite idol. It seems to be the in thing to do. You know that businessmen are doing it, sports people are doing it, movie stars are doing it, singers are doing it, and now even preachers are doing it. But what is the secret spot of the child of God? Well, to humanity, the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Not by their tattoos, by their fruits you shall know them. What fruit is being manifested in the lives of God's people out there? Um, because when there's the evidence of the fruit of life, the fruit of righteousness, then there's a light shining in a dark place. If I'm a member of the family of the Most High God, then the Lord Jesus puts it like this. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. God knows those who are his. The spot that is upon our soul is the spot of God. It's not a, a spot of sin. It's a spot of righteousness because it's of God. And my sheep hear my voice. These are the sheep that have been found of him. Remember, all we are like sheep, we've, turned, we've gone astray. And yet, if we are found of the Lord, because he would send after that one that would stray from the 99, and he would seek out that one. Perhaps you are that one today. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. That's, that's the mark of the believer. Can I ask you a question as I conclude? Do you bear the open, visible marks of God's children? Well, you say, well, it is, we don't have tattoos. Well, I'm not talking about tattoos. Paul writes... In Galatians chapter 6 verse 17, remember you were sort of tosses who persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. You obtained mercy because that which you did was in ignorance. And the problem with a lot of people out there today is that they're ignorant. And uh, we need to get back to the word of God so that our ignorance can be enlightened. So that we can know. Uh, and if we know, uh, then we can learn to understand. And we get to that place where we understand, then the Spirit of God is able to enlighten our understanding. Paul writes, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. It wasn't a tattoo. It was his suffering for Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 25 puts it like this, just some portion of it. Of the Jews, five times received our forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And so it goes on uh, to illustrate how it is that he suffers for the Lord, suffered for the Lord Jesus and he bore in his body the marks of Christ. Not a tattoo, which really shouldn't happen 
in your body because we are the temple of the living God. And we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. But I want you to just note this. Our iniquities were placed upon him. He was bruised for our iniquities. Remember that. That's all embracing. Matthew 27, 36 to 37 says, um, as uh, they sat down and they watched him, and they were set up above his head an accusation, which was written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Right, so, uh, this is Jesus. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be Christ in you. And what happens, the Spirit of God baptizes you into Jesus Christ, and you'll be Jesus Christ. And you can say with Paul, uh, the apostle, that great apostle of the Lord Jesus in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live, I live in, in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so I have someone who's overtake, uh, taken over my life, the Lord Jesus Christ, recognized by our Heavenly Father, because this is Christ in my life. That is the mark, that is the spot uh, that would identify us as being the children of the living God. I appeal to you, dear friend, today, as I conclude, that you would open your heart. And I mentioned how that the Lord Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. Won't you open up your heart? Receive the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sins and your transgressions to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Receive him by faith. Ask him to come into your life. Uh, and he'll do that. And so as I conclude in prayer, may it be that your heart would be right there uh, with me and with my, my, my understanding of that which I've shared with you today that you might become a new creation. And the Bible does have this to say um, in the second book of Corinthians. Um, it, it says this, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. For we have made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the promise of God's word. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, Lord, for those that would at this time feel upon their hearts the need to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation. I pray for them, Lord, and may it just be uh, through uh, the simplicity of their own understanding that they would just invite you into their lives as, uh, as um, their own personal saviour. I commend them to you and to the word of your Christ, dear Lord, that today there may be salvation in the households mm -hmm that are listening here. I ask you these mercies in Jesus' name and for your sake. Amen. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much for, for that, Des. And uh, once again, just thank you, everybody, for being with us today. We pray that the Lord will bless you as you share, uh, as you have shared with us today, that, that as you've heard what God is, God's word has been towards us, um, that you'll take it to heart. And that you'll allow that word to to have an impact in your life. Um, God's word is is powerful and it's quick and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. <clears throat> but the most important thing that it requires is for you and me to respond to it. And uh, I urge you today to do that. <clears throat> if you want to speak to somebody, you'll see our details um, contained in the details of this of this live chat. Please feel free to phone us or drop us a message, or drop us an email, and we'll be very happy to get back to you and, and uh, minister to your needs. Uh, once again, thank you very much for being with us today. We pray that the Lord will bless you. Um, it's a lovely day outside again. seems that we're just blessed with these over and over again at this time of year, and uh, I trust that you will uh, enjoy the day, uh, despite the fact that we're in lockdown, um, just to enjoy the, the, the sunshine and, and God's blessed creation that he's given to us. Uh, Pray the Lord bless you today. God bless. Bye-bye.